Okay, well, first of all, uh, thank you guys for asking me to do this. How this all came about is there's a there's a small group of us uh, in Midland, Odessa that are pretty active with messing around with the, the crossband repeater in particular on the International Space Station. And so uh, that's that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to concentrate on crossband repeater operations. Uh, they also reconfigure those radios from time to time. They do packet. There's a separate radio where the astronauts occasionally talk to hams and talk to a lot of school children. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. But that's what we're going to concentrate on tonight just for the sake of some brevity is we're just going to talk about how how to do crossband repeater operations. The do's, the don'ts, what works antenna-wise, what doesn't work antenna-wise, and with the ISS we'll talk a little bit about antennas and you'd be surprised at what works. Just about everything works. I've done it with a handheld with a rubber duck on it. So it's pretty amazing. Okay, so next slide, Dave. I'm going to give you just a quick overview of the ISS. I assume everybody knows the general mission of the ISS. So just some other little trinkets of interest uh, regarding the ISS and its, its potential fate considering the current political climate. During this presentation, we'll do a quick overview of the onboard radios and the modes that are used. We'll talk about the frequencies and your configurations for ACUSO, antenna systems, and methods for hams. And then we'll talk about how I personally make contacts with the with the ISS. Everybody does it a little bit differently. I was kind of hoping Larry Keene would be here because he does it a really, really interesting way. But we'll talk about how some of the other guys do it locally and kind of how this presentation came to be. Incidentally, we would always, after a ISS pass, get on the permanent. Everybody who was working the ISS, we'd have like a little conference <laughs> after the pass was over with and we would talk about what we heard, what we didn't hear. Capture effect is a big thing because it's FM and so we were all hearing slightly different things and that garnered a lot of attention. People started getting interested in how to do this, just hearing us talk about it after the fact and that's kind of how this presentation came to be. So next slide. ISS is widely accepted as being the single most expensive man-made object in history. I forget the numbers, but it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars as of 2010. So it was, it was some incredible number, like 150 or 160 billion dollars 10 years ago, and they're still dumping money into it. So that's pretty astounding to me. It has a period of about 90 minutes, so it completely orbits the Earth about every 90 minutes, travels at about five miles a second. That works out to between 17,000 and 17,500 miles an hour. So there's quite a bit of Doppler shift to have to deal with, as you might imagine, when you're working these. You can compensate for it or you can not compensate for it. We'll talk about that as well. In 24 hours, it goes uh, 16 times around the Earth, actually about 15 and a half times around the Earth. And it does cycle through 16 sunsets and 16 sunrises. 357 feet long from end to end. It's the second brightest object in the night sky next to the moon. So if you've ever seen the ISS pass overhead with the naked eye with the sun really shining on it at night, it's pretty amazing. You will think that there is a fire in the sky. It's, it's fantastic. It's fun just to watch it, if nothing else. It's pretty nifty. I'm sure most of you guys have done that. It can dock six spacecraft at the same time, although I do not think simultaneously. Simultaneously. That's a, a that's a lot of power and a lot of resources to do multiple spacecraft at the same time, but it can have up to six dot. It weighs about 420,000 kilograms, or for those of you who can do math without base 10, that's about a little over a quarter million pounds, about the same as 300 SUVs, 350 sedans, something like that. So it's a sizable object. Orbit is 250 miles, give or take, above the Earth, depending on where it is. From time to time, they have to do a orbit correction burn, usually once a month-ish. It loses about two kilometers a month, and it can lose even more depending on what they're docking with it and what experiments they have going on and at certain times depending on what Russian spacecraft is docking with it they will intentionally lower the orbit to accommodate docking craft. I, actually I don't think they do that much anymore but for a long time they did it. First component module was launched in 1998 and it has been consistently occupied by humans since 2006. It's tentatively scheduled to be re-entered into the atmosphere and destroyed in 2030 or 2031, but Russia 
has a big ownership stake in the ISS and obviously things are not good between us and Russia right now. They're threatening to pull everything, especially as we increase sanctions. They're looking at sort of a contingency plan if they should have to re-enter it in 2024. The big thing with re-entering the International Space Station is it's so big that the debris field is anticipated to be something like a thousand to two thousand miles long. They're not actually sure. So they want to re-enter it on an azimuth toward Point Nemo to hopefully keep it from damaging persons and property and all that sort of thing. It's, a, it's kind of weird to think that they didn't think about that too hard apparently from the very beginning. But Okay, so next, next slide. So here are the radios that are on board. In the Columbia module, we have the radio that we're going to be most talking about, and it's a Kenwood D710GA. It's for the crossband repeater. They occasionally reconfigure it for packet. Generally, they'll run about a month of crossband and about a month of packet, and then they'll take it down for a little while for maintenance or for special operations. But they have had it on crossband repeater mode for a very long time now, for months, which is very unusual. It's the first time I've ever seen it that way. And according to ARISS.org, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, that website always has the status and the configurations of the radio so you don't you know, wake yourself up in the middle of the night for a good pass and the radio shut off or something like that. They do a good job of keeping that updated. The uplink is on two meters, it's 145.99 megahertz with a 67 hertz PL tone. And the downlink is 437.800 megahertz on 70 centimeters. It's a really good sounding radio. That's the main radio we'll be talking about. There's another radio in the, uh, in the service module that doesn't get used very much. And it runs packet a lot when it is up. And it runs it on simplex 145.825 megahertz. That's uplink and downlink. And then when they switch it to FM phone, this is usually to talk to school kids, but that's a 145.8 downlink and 144.49 uplink with the 67 hertz PL tone. Every once in a while, if you work it just right, you can talk to an astronaut. You got to get them when the radio's on, when they're not during their normal working hours, and they work basically 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, UTC. They have generally weekends off, and they take breaks during the day, and every once in a while, they'll go kick the radio on and make some calls. So it's rare and if you've done this you've gotten one of the holy grails in UHF VHF ham radios talking to an astronaut. There's some cool videos on YouTube of guys doing it just getting basically lucky. So antennas and contact methodology. This is one of the easiest satellites to work in amateur radio and I think it's a combination of just how good the equipment is, how well it's attended to, the nature and orbit and speed of the ISS itself and just the simple fact that it's always on. If you have ever worked any other FM crossband repeaters on satellites, you've got to watch their Twitter feed or watch their Instagram, watch their social media, figure out when they've got the power to turn it on and when it's going to be available and then you try to make your contact. With the ISS, there's generally always power and they're generally always configured. The exception would be when they're doing some kind of a high-end operation like, you know, they're docking a spacecraft or something, they need to conserve power, they'll shut that stuff off and you won't be able to use it during that time. It's generally down for 24 to 48 hours when they're doing those kinds of operations. You can use everything from a handheld Yagi. That's how Larry does it and he listens on one radio and he transmits on another radio. I've gotten to where I do that too, but I I don't use a handheld Yagi. I'll show you my configuration. But the great thing about handheld Yagi is if you've got some kind of a moving Yagi, for as simple as this, this is a student in the UK talking to the ISS, but also you can get really fancy with this as I'm sure you guys all know. You can have phased following arrays. You can get nutty with it. There's a lady out in Apple Valley, California. Her call sign escapes me, but I believe LTY Lima Tango Yankee is her suffix. I may have that wrong. But I hear her a lot working various satellites, including the ISS, and she has a similar setup to that, and that's her main thing in ham radio. She likes doing satellite work. But I've done it with 
two bow things. I've done it with two UV5Rs. I set one on the downlink and open the squelch up and then I transmit with the other one and I literally follow it across the sky and if you guys know Quincy KX5S, he heard me in Oklahoma on the downlink standing out in front of my office in the parking lot working it with two UV5Rs. Now that depends on the pass. I and mean, We'll talk about the passes. The passes are really important. You'll find that however your system is set up, certain passes work better than others. Certain azimuths work better than others. Certain elevations work better than others. Here is how I do it. Just ignore this pole in the center. This is my 40 meter dipole and then I've got a vertical off-center fed dipole going up and down it. But these are the two antennas that I use for working satellites, for working the ISS in particular. I transmit with this Comet GP3 and I receive with this big uh, Workman 300. The reason I like to do that, I actually will receive with this one as well, but this has excellent, excellent receive and I'll receive with another radio. There's something about this antenna in particular for working the ISS with vertical antennas that I just love the reception of this. It's got 11 and a half dB of gain on transmit. It's an insane amount of gain on transmit, but that somehow translates to really good reception. So generally I will receive with this antenna and transmit with this one. Now the thing about using verticals when you're doing this is again it comes down to the pass. Generally I'll have a receive radio setup of some kind, some kind of handheld usually, and then I've got my ICOM ID5100A, and that's what I transmit. I'll transmit and receive with that using both VFOs. It just kind of helps me cover my bases and hopefully ensures that I hear everything a little bit better. Because things get weird, especially on a busy pass. You'll hear a station coming in really strong and it will be captured by another station who can't hear that station trying to transmit. We'll talk about the protocols for that, but it, on, on a busy pass it can be tough to work the International Space Station on crossband. So generally I'll go over here to 145.99, I've got my tone in there. You don't generally want to do this, I'm on high power, that's 50 watts and that's generally unnecessary. Apparently, I switched my VFOs over just to take this picture and I noticed, man, I was on high power. I'll, I'll leave that in the picture. I was having trouble, or I was struggling for some reason, and generally when I go to high power and go to 50 watts, that's because somebody's trying to call me or I'm trying to call somebody and we can't get each other's call signs. So I will bump it up, and then I apparently made the call, and I think I remember which one this was, and then I stopped. So after I make a contact, especially on a busy pass, if I make a positive QSO and we exchange information, I stop and I leave the repeater to everybody else because these passes last about five to six minutes and your period within that five or six minutes, your sweet spot where there's no Doppler shift or minimal Doppler shift is generally 75 seconds to about 100 seconds. So if you want to work at verticals like I do, you have a limited amount of time. So once I make a contact, I get out and I make room for everybody else. Unless somebody else calls me. If somebody else calls me and it's not that busy, I'll obviously will answer them. Here's what the horizon footprint looks like as the ISS is passing over. And it's pretty big and of course it's UHF VHF so it's actually slightly longer than line of sight. If you use a website like N2YO, November 2, YankeeOscar.com, which is what I used for all of these, it will show you the actual visual footprint of the ISS. You've got a little bit more than that if you're working satellite, if you're working packet, or if you're working FM with it. So you can kind of tell when if you watch this in real time, you can watch this live in real time. As it's about to pass over, turn your radio on, turn your squelch all the way off, open the radio up, and you'll start to hear stuff way out in the distance. It sounds like ghosts. And there's this weird shift and the weird captures that are happening. And as it moves closer and closer to its apex over your position, whether it's at 90 degrees or at 20 degrees, you start to really hear what's going on. For me, I've found that on receive, I can essentially compensate a little bit for the Doppler shift by, as it approaches, I go up five KCs on my VFO, on receive VFO manual. 
or you can make a little program that's 5 kcs up. The Doppler effect, I mean, it's just like a train horn going by. It's going to be slightly higher frequency as it approaches at 17,000 miles an hour, and it's going to be slightly lower as it moves away at 17,000 miles an hour. So 5 kcs generally works for me on receive. I can kind of tell what's happening, what to expect as I move into the sweet spot, and then if I want to keep listening, I can go down after it moves past. That's how I do it. The passes that work best for me are actually not these passes. <laughs> the passes that work best for me are the ones that start from a southwest azimuth and move up to a northeast azimuth. It's because of the orientation of my antennas, the orientation of my property. But I do okay with these passes that go to the south. And the passes that go overhead when you're trying to make these contacts, just know that your sweet spot is a lot shorter. That's when you get like a 75 or maybe 80 second sweet spot. These ones that are out at 40 degrees or maybe way over here, this is more like an 18 degree pass. Those sweet spots will actually last a very long time, although other unpredictable things can happen. You also get stations that are further away because you're not in the center of the footprint, you're more on the edge of the footprint. That affects the Doppler shift too, so you have to do a lot of experimenting to figure out what works best with your system. Actually, N2YO.com will let you set alerts, and it'll alert you when a pass is coming over a few minutes before. It's mainly geared for watching it on visible passes, but you can select visible passes or visible and non-visible passes. How to do a contact exchange with the ISS in particular. Has anybody here ever worked satellites at all? No? Okay. One of the things you do not want to do on any FM phone or sideband phone or whatever, any phone contact on a satellite, never, ever call CQ. All it does is waste time. Everybody knows what you're there for. We're all there for the same thing. And so all you want to do when you start to hear stations coming in, people are calling up to the ISS, you're hearing them on the downlink, and you want to try to get those stations, you give phonetically your call sign and your grid square. That's it. Whiskey 5, Golf, Foxtrot Oscar, Delta Mike 81. Wait. See if anybody calls you back. Try not to walk on anybody. If you're doing this at 2 a.m. on a Wednesday, there's probably going to be five people on there and you can make contacts with two of them. But if you're doing it at 3 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, there's going to be hundreds of stations. It's going to be a cacophony. And so you have to really stay patient, be polite. Uh, here's an example. So I got Gordy, K5GLT, recently. He was at Elephant Butte, New Mexico, and I was here in Midland. We knew each other, which made it a little easier to make the contact, but we kept it very short. I heard K5GLT, and he gave his grid score there at Elephant Butte in that state park he was working. And I heard him, and so I simply said, K5GLT from Whiskey 5, Golf, Foxtrot Oscar, Delta Mike 81, QSL? And that's it. And he answered me back. He said, hello, Tim, good contact, 73. And I said, good contact, 73. And that's it. I was done. We freed it up and let other people do it. They need to be very, very fast. It's the same if you don't know somebody. So if George and I didn't know each other and I heard, I heard his call sign in his grid square, he was somewhere else or whatever, I would simply call back to him with my call sign. And I would say this. I would say, KG5, KUQ, please copy Whiskey 5 Golf. Foxtrot Oscar, Delta Mike 81, QSL. And if he QSLs, he'll say, Whiskey 5, Golf, Foxtrot Oscar, good contact, 73, or words to that effect. I'll say 73, and we're done. And it frees it up for everybody else. So that, I've found, is the best way to do satellite contacts with phone. Uh, guys calling CQ, guys who want to have a conversation, the guys who want to tell you what radio they're running and what antennas they're using, you don't do that with these types of passes on satellite. All you're going to do is piss everybody off. And with the, with the young guys and guys who just got their technician licenses, it's, it's understandable. You just want to tell them. I've done it straight up. I've gone, do not call CQ on a satellite. And then somebody else goes, yeah. And then, so yeah, you know, young operators or new operators, it's forgivable. But yeah, you definitely want to keep these super, super short and be very efficient and effective in how you communicate. Okay, here is what the, yeah, you can kill the sound if you want to. We don't need it. The music's pretty crappy. This is how the satellite orbits Earth. Eccentricity is something like 0 0.007 at about 250 miles, moving 17,000 miles an hour. So you, you will see as we move through this animation that 
essentially wherever you live you're going to get the pass you want from northwest to southeast it might pass from southwest to northeast it might pass above you it may pass at 15 degrees 30 degrees it can be anything up to 90 degrees so once you figure out what passes work best for your station you can pick and choose what's going to work and that's what i recommend you do i should have continued when i was talking about transmit power 15 watts is what works best for me you can do it with five watts 5 watts is fine. 5 watts is actually preferable, but using verticals, 15 watts is about what works fine for me. And if somebody's trying with me and we're not having any luck and I'm running out of time, I'll go to high power temporarily and then I'll be done one way or the other. But generally, about 15 watts is what works for me. 100 watts or 200 watts. If you're sending 200 watts to the International Space Station, you, you need somebody to kick you in the backside because that's just excessive and that's not in the spirit of ham radio in my opinion in my opinion a lot of times it's just as fun to listen and see what's going on as it is to try to get in there and mix it up and I would recommend that if you decide to do this that indeed listen for a while I came back to ham radio during the pandemic in 2020 after a long break from ham radio and I've been doing this pretty much ever since and I'm not I haven't gotten tired of it yet it's just totally awesome so any questions or uh, anything you guys want to discuss I'll be glad to to talk about it if I can answer sure Darren. So on the, over, on the overhead passes mm -hmm. do you have good luck with the vertical on those? Yes and no. On the, on the sides? Yes and no. I have better on the sides. Okay. Uh, generally passes near vertical don't work terribly well for me for two reasons. Number one I'm using a vertical so radiation pattern obviously is a huge factor in that but also because your sweet spot with with minimal Doppler shift is just very short and so if it's really really busy when I hit the sweet spot I, a lot of times I won't even call if it's quiet or there's just a few stations I will sometimes and I've done well with that and that's sometimes where I'll bump the power up a little bit more generally what works for me is passes that go south of my house from northwest or west to east or southeast between about 20 degrees and 40 degrees that's my sweet spot I do really well I do really well with when with those types of passes George how much power are they using on the downline? You know, that's a good question. Uh, I meant to try to look that up. I've actually looked that up before and wasn't sure if what I found was the truth because it was all forum information. I do not know what the what the 70 centimeter downlink transmit power is. I thought I heard that it was easily less than 10, if not less than 5. It, it could be. Yeah, just also the same power. Side. You, don't, mm -hmm. you don't need, yeah. they don't want to waste a lot of power. Right. Yeah, yeah, power conservation is a big thing on the ISS for sure. It's a good point. To these other satellites, so they've got way more power. Oh yeah. Than these other dual oh yeah. Yeah. If you want to work, uh, there are some, there are some small <coughs> parasite launched amateur radio satellites that have FM crossband repeaters, and man, you got to work them just right to get them because they don't have a lot of power. They only turn them on at certain times, and then you got to pick your pass on top of that. So, yeah. Go ahead, Steve. My wife has a spot for station app on her phone. Yeah. Would that help? Because you can actually hmm. see it, so you can take your antenna. And just you, you actually could. That's how you do it. Yeah, yeah. That would be great. That's a great way to do it. I know that you know on night passes you can you can follow it across with your handheld Yagi or during during the daytime you know you'll you'll see a couple of guys you know at a field day or something and a satellite passes over. One guy's got the receiver and a phone. The other guy's got the Yagi and the transmitter. It's just fun, you so know. Do you record your your QSO or do you? Uh, yes, I. In fact, I had one that I recorded, but it's it's too big. I couldn't upload it onto my web server. It was like 15 minutes long, and the and I didn't have time to edit it down to just the minute that one minute. But on the pass that I was going to show you guys, I got K3 Triple R, and he called me. I just went Whiskey Five Golf Fox Trot Oscar Delta Mike 81. Kicked back. Didn't hear anything, heard other stations. I thought, well, I'll try it again. And right about that time, I heard W5FGO, K3 Triple R. So that added a little time to the QSO because I had to correct him. But 
I emphasized golf, foxtrot, Oscar. He said, oh, I got you that time. Golf, foxtrot, Oscar. Good time. Contact 73. I said, 73 to you as well. We were done. And it saved the rest of the pass for other people. And it was a really good example of, I think, how to do it. And I wish I could have shown you guys, but it didn't quite work out. You really don't have time to be writing anything down. If I'm working, the good thing about working verticals and working from a base station is that I'm looking for my sweet spot. I'm looking for the right pass. And I can write down grid square and I actually don't worry about the grid square a lot of times unless they're not operating from their home QTH. Generally, I can get them written down and get them confirmed. But yeah, it just depends on how you're doing it. You can In the field, it can be really complicated. It's good to have two guys, uh, especially if you're using Yagi's. David? Do you get different propagation to different times of day? Yes. So one of the things that can affect this, that was a good, really good question. I'm glad you asked that because this brings up Larry again, who also is one of the guys who works the ISS a lot. If there is tropospheric ducting going on, and the ISS passes over, astounding things can happen. Larry made a contact with a station in England on the ISS on FM crossband, and there was a, there had to have been tropospheric ducting going on because he was England obviously was well outside the footprint. Yeah, it, it was crazy. He heard the call sign, he wrote it down and called back to her, and he was like, that's weird, That uh, what is that call sign? He didn't recognize it as being the UK at first. He went and looked her up on QRZ. He had made a contact with England, so yeah. 250 miles though, it's in the F2 layer. Yes, yeah. It's, it's not above it or below it, it's, it's in, in it. the F2 layer. Yeah, good point. So, you know, you should get some, some uh, things happening just because of the density of the ionosphere. At yes. Point. Yeah, very much agreed. Any anything else? Do you adjust frequency for the Doppler? My receive. I don't adjust my transmit. The reason I adjust my receive is just so I can get an idea of exactly what's going on before I hit the sweet spot. The sweet spot's always going to be about the apex of the pass to your position. And that helps me to kind of decide, am I going to try to transmit? Am I going to call? Am I not going to call? How busy is it? What stations? Trying to maybe get some stations ahead of time and then you can call them if they're still strong when they come into the sweet spot. And of course, if you're following, if you're following somehow, whether if you've got an array or a handheld or something and you're following, that's usually not a big deal. But I almost always will just wait for the ISS to come into my sweet spot on whatever that pass is. That's when I'll transmit if I'm going to. That's just how I do it because I'm using verticals. I've got 20, but somewhere between 20 and 30. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you guys for having me, asking me to do this. Good time. You bet. Oh, yeah. My pleasure.